Before I begin my talk, I just need to take a quick second to note that as a cadet at the US Coast Guard Academy, I'm a federal employee, um, which means my opinions aren't necessarily those of the US Coast Guard or the US Department of Homeland Security. Now, uh, probably the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the US Coast Guard is search and rescue. Maybe picture helicopters flying through hurricanes, boats crashing through waves, pretty crazy stuff. Now back in high school, this was a big reason why I decided to join the Coast Guard in the first place. I wanted a bit of adventure, but I also knew that I wanted to save lives. Now when I, when I joined the Coast Guard, I always thought of search and rescue as being as simple as dispatching a helicopter. I never realized how many moving components go into each one of our search and rescue cases. We have predictive softwares that allow us to optimize our search patterns, and we have an entire support infrastructure working behind the scenes to make sure these cases are resolved well. Search and rescue is much more of a science than it appears in the movies. I think it's impossible to understand the gravity of our work unless your life has been on the line, unless you've needed to call the Coast Guard or 911. Thankfully, I've never been in this position, but one of my best friends from the academy has. Now, back in high school, he and his best friend were sailing around Lake Champlain in northern Vermont. It was late March, so it was a, a tropical 40 degrees. Um, so, hardy Vermonters, there was a lot of runoff in the water, which meant there were a lot of logs, um, roots, um, just general debris in the water. And they ended up striking one of those logs, and um, they knocked off the rudder for, to their sailboat. Not a big deal, they dropped down the sails, and his friend reached out to grab the rudder except it was just outside of reach. So they took a quick glance at each other and his friend decided to jump in to swim after the rudder. Not a big deal because he was wearing a wetsuit, um, except at that moment, the wind picked up out of nowhere. Um, and suddenly he was starting to drift further and further away. And as hard as he could swim, he just couldn't make it back to the boat. And suddenly a totally normal day on the water became one of the worst days of their lives. Now at the time, my friend didn't have a radio on him, so he couldn't call the Coast Guard or 911, so he was left helpless as his friend drifted further away. Um, really dire situation. But thankfully, there was a passing windsurfer who had a, who had a radio on him, called in the Coast Guard, and about 25 minutes later, we showed up with one of our small boats, and thankfully, we found him shortly thereafter clinging for dear life to a buoy. He just had hypothermia, and it could have been so much worse. Now, when my friend tells me this story, there are two things that stand out from that day. The first one is this sense of relief that he felt when he found out his friend had been rescued. He wasn't going to his best friend's funeral later on. The other thing he describes to me is this sense of helplessness that he felt before he could call the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard prides itself in never letting any call go unanswered. They were always, always ready, ready to answer the call, except he couldn't make that call in the first place. And as I've reflected on this, I think it highlights just how much our search and rescue mission has changed over the last 20 years. 20 years ago, we would have responded to this case differently than we did on that day. And in particular, the search component of that search and rescue mission is rapidly evolving. Now, when I say search, I mean the process of figuring out where a survivor is, whether that's um, a hurricane survivor, maybe a, a lost kayaker, um, a sinking vessel. This is rapidly changing. I think the perfect example that highlights just how much this evolution has taken place is comparing our responses from Hurricane Katrina to Hurricane Harvey last year. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, the Coast Guard is credited with saving over 30,000 lives. 13 years ago, we did what we do best. We sent every helicopter, every flood team, every small boat that we had, and we began plucking people off of rooftops. We pride ourselves in being Semper Paratus, always ready. And for those 30,000 lives that we touched, we were their guardian angels. I think it's important to note that 13 years ago, the world we lived in was pretty different compared to today. That whole smartphone, smartphone thing, that wasn't around for another two years. Um, Facebook was still in its infancy, so the whole idea of posting to social media wasn't really a concept. Fast forward to today, and that has some pretty broad implications for the way that the Coast Guard and other first responders do their mission, how they respond to disaster situations. So when I got to the academy, I decided to start exploring the implications of these changes. I decided to merge my, my passions for technology and uh, for saving lives, and I, uh, I decided to start taking a look at the implications that social media has for the way the Coast Guard does disaster response. Come to find out, the Coast Guard actually hasn't 
um, been trained in, how do you respond to a 911 post? So if you're a hurricane survivor trapped on a roof somewhere posting to Facebook saying, hey, I need rescuing, um, we haven't had a traditional means of answering those calls. So I knew that by the time the next storm, the next hurricane, um, maybe the next earthquake rolled around, we needed to figure out a way to monitor social media. So um, that, uh, the next storm that ended up taking place was Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey was something of a perfect storm in that it came out of nowhere. So suddenly uh, it grew from a tropical storm to a category four hurricane virtually overnight, leaving the city of Houston with virtually no time to, to evacuate. Now, when the storm made landfall, it virtually stalled over, uh, over Houston. So we have tens of thousands of people trapped in the city of Houston, and then suddenly you have four feet of water dumped on the city. Um, pretty bad situation, right? Um, so I want you to picture this. You are, um, you've been forced onto your roof. You're out in the freezing cold rain, and you've been on hold with 911 for four, six, maybe eight hours but you haven't been able to reach 911. What are you gonna do? I'd be willing to bet you're gonna post to social media, whether that's Facebook, Twitter, maybe even Instagram. Because maybe you can't reach 911, but a family member, a friend can. And I knew because of my research that this was probably a scenario that was going to play out thousands of times across the city of Houston, and that's exactly what happened. And I felt a moral obligation, the sense of duty to do something. So I began working with this organization called the Digital Humanitarian Network. The DHN is this collaborative network of mapping um, social media experts from around the world, and they're all volunteers. And they'll come out of the woodworks during disaster responses to start combing through social media, looking for exactly that information, those 911 posts. So I began working with them and creating the maps like the ones you see behind me. One of the things that I learned very early on in this response is data needs to tell a story. Just Bulk 911 calls is great, but I'm sorry to say this, but we had no shortage of 911 calls, 911 calls to respond to. This was the story that we told. We were sending these maps across the service and to other first responders, including FEMA and other local fire departments. So flood teams were getting this. Hurricane um, task forces were getting them. Um, helicopter pilots, admirals, intel units, they were all using this to answer strategic level questions. Now when I say strategic level questions, I mean if you're a helicopter pilot, you have no shortage of calls to respond to, how are you going to do the most good? That's a really important question to answer, and this is how you answer it. Throughout the course of this week, I knew our search and rescue mission was beginning to evolve. Previously, the Coast Guard hadn't been trained in how do you respond to these 911 posts, but crisis is the best catalyst for innovation, and we were innovating. By the end of this week, we'd collected over 1,000 search and rescue cases involving 5,200 survivors. And by the end of the response, the Coast Guard was credited with over, saving over 11,000 lives. Um, pretty amazing stuff. Each of these stats are powerful, but the moment where this hit me in particular was with one case in particular. Um, we got a three-year-old girl who was on a ventilator in her house had just lost power. Um, and sure, her family had been on hold with 911 for four hours. We watched as her story was retweeted thousands of times in the span of a few hours. And um, eventually she was rescued by first responders because of this. Really powerful stuff. And I think what I took out of this is just how important it is for us, the first responders, to stay on this pulse of technology, to stay on the cutting edge of technology, and to change with the world around us. When I look at the future of disaster response, I don't think it's ever been brighter. I think that the 21st century is going to be driven by artificial intelligence, machine learning, data analytics, deep learning, and each of these technologies holds immense potential for those whose lives are on the line. We can use artificial intelligence to automate 911 operators. So those four, six, eight hour waiting times, those go away entirely. We can use deep learning to automate the process of analyzing drone and satellite imagery. We could paint a picture like we've never had before. But I think what I'm most excited about is the idea of being able to predict where those search and rescue cases are going to come from. I'd be willing to bet there's some sort of a pattern up there that we could use to predict where search and rescue cases are going to come from. 
that saves lives. And if this doesn't get you excited about the future of disaster response, frankly, I don't know what will. Um, <laughs> when I look at this future, though, I, it's going to be hard to create. Like, change is hard. Change takes time. But we have to remember that there's nothing more noble than saving lives. We have a sacred job. And that's something we need to remember every single day. The word emergency comes from emerge, to rise up and out of. I believe that out of the rubble, the ashes, the flooding, the very best in each of us emerges. And it's my mission to stay on the pulse of technology so when the next disaster strikes, the Coast Guard is semper paratus. Always ready. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.